So the, the game of golf, <laughs> the game of golf is governed by the rules of golf. Just like any sport, right? Any sport that you compete in is going to be governed by rules that apply to how that sport is played, how the competition actually um, happens, you know, among and between people. Um, and the rules of golf are important. Uh, last year, we were on vacation, and uh, I have three kids. Uh, all three of them play golf, and, uh, and we were at a place where there were a couple golf courses, and so um, sometimes we'd go and play golf together. Sometimes, um, you know, like my girls would go play with their boyfriends, um, whatever. So there's, there's people coming and going playing golf, and one of the interesting things that would happen is, like, we'd be back at the, um, uh, at the hotel and, you know, sitting around the table, kind of just talking about the day. And uh, one of my kids would say, uh, just talk about her round of golf and what she scored, right? And then, uh, and then another one would almost sort of judgmentally be like, oh, really? That's wow, that's not very good. Um, I scored, right? And, and, and so there was this, like, comparison of the scores that were, um, that were achieved in playing golf that day. And, um, and the first one, <laughs> she was annoyed um, because, like, she knew, as, you know, as I did, that, like, she was, when she said, here's what I got for a score, like, her score was what she earned in that round of golf. Like, she counted all of her strokes and wrote down hole by hole what she scored on that hole and then added them up and that was her score. That's what she did. The other one did something similar, but not exactly, right? Like when she went out to play, um, the rules were managed, right? To, to, make the, to make the time spent on the golf course a little more enjoyable, probably, um, you, you know, she hits one she doesn't like, she re-hits one. This one didn't go where I wanted it to go, I'll just hit another one, right? I didn't make that putt, well, I, you know, normally would make that putt, so I'll just count it as if I made that putt. And so she writes down, hole by hole, what she got for scores, adds them up, and would you believe she scored way better, than the other one. Now, why is that? Well, it's because one was following the rules of golf and one was not. Now, there's a lot of you who play golf casually, perhaps, um, and there's lots, I mean, there's thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that play golf casually. And I, I just want to, I want you to know that there's a difference between playing the sport of golf and going out to a golf course and whacking a ball around. There's a difference between that. And, and, while I'm going to make it sound like one is preferred over the other, that um, for the purpose of the analogy, that is sort of the idea, but I, I don't want anybody who is just, you know, kind of going around the golf course whacking balls around to feel bad about doing that. That's great. Like, you love to do that. That's great. I, I just want you to know that what you're doing is you're not playing golf. You're doing something else, right? Like, if you go out there and you... Uh, you hit the ball, and, and, uh, and you just sort of, you, you, you're out there for the enjoyment, for the leisure, for the exercise, for the companionship of other people. That's all fine and great. But if you're not scoring according to the rules of golf, you're not playing golf. You're golfing, but you're not playing golf. You're doing something that's different. Um, when, I, when I first took up the game, I was in my 20s, and I, I fell in love with it right away, and I started playing um, and practicing a lot. I practiced uh, an awful lot. And I, you know, I got pretty good pretty quickly. And I played a lot of times by myself. And so um, when you're playing competitive golf, you have a handicap, right, which is basically a number that, that is sort of a, a measurement of where you are in terms of your ability. And so every time you play around, you post your score, right, goes into the computer, and ultimately your handicap, you know, goes up, goes down, stays the same, depending on how you play. And as I was getting better, there, there, there came this point where, um, you know, sometimes I would, I'd be out there and I'd be playing by myself, right, and I'd have, uh, I'd be on the putting green, and I'd have a, a, a 20-foot putt, which almost 10 times out of 10, I should, I should be able to, to make that in two putts, right? I should putt it, 
chances are it doesn't go in, but the next one's just a tap in, right? And then I walk off and go to the next hole. Um, but oftentimes what I would do is what we who in the world of golf really, really, really detest is I three putt, right? It took me three putts to get in the hole. And so sometimes I'd have, you know, a putt that was this long and I'd miss it. And then I'd, and then I'd say, I don't ever miss those, right? And so in my mind and, and perhaps even on my scorecard, like I wouldn't count the stroke. I'd just say, you know, I always make those. And so I, I considered it as if I had made it. And so what that would end up doing, you know, over the course of a round is maybe shaving off a stroke or two, you know, from my scorecard, right? No big deal. Um, and then that score would get entered into the computer. My handicap would, um, would adjust appropriately. Now, what I discovered was that because I had this tendency of doing that kind of thing, or like if I was faced with a difficult decision and I decided to go for it, right, and it didn't work out, and, and I said, well, you know, if I were playing a, a real round with real people or in a competitive space, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have chosen to do that. So I'll, I'll go with, you know, I, I tried it. It didn't work out. That's no big deal. I'll just, I'll just re-hit, right? And, and so I wasn't really counting it all up. And so what happened was my, my handicap artificially got lower than really. Where is that? So in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm not bad at putting. But then I'd go into a tournament where you had to count everything, where you had to play exactly by the rules of golf. And, and my score in the tournament would be much more disappointing than what I thought I was capable of. And eventually I came to realize, it's like, oh, well, no, I guess I am actually that bad at putting, <laughs> right? Because every time I'm in a competition, I, like, I do three putt, that 20-foot putt from time to time. I do miss that putt that I thought I never missed this putt, right? And so the scoring of golf is an important thing. My handicap is actually a fairly objective measurement of the golfer that I am. I, I can think all I want that I am better, but that number is really, it's just, it's the number, right? And so it does point to something. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, the tail end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, what might sound like some pretty harrowing words um, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and I hope that as we look at this, it'll be, it'll be challenging. Um, it'll just kind of awaken us, you know, to really consider what does it mean you know, to be in this pursuit of following Jesus, right? That's what we've been talking about um, these last few weeks is um, laying aside the things that keep us from really engaging in and living a life of pursuing and following Jesus because because of the desire we have so oftentimes to hold on to other things. All right, so let me read Matthew chapter seven verses twenty one through twenty three. This is Jesus speaking. He says, "Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven." but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Just think about that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, you can just you know, think about the kind of person that might stand before Jesus um, and acknowledge him to some degree as Lord, but he says of some that they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he remarks on what seems to be sort of the deciding factor as to whether or not somebody enters into the kingdom of heaven. He says, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, so now he looks forward. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And they go into this history lesson of their lives. And say to Jesus, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name? And do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, again, this is Jesus, now directing his attention to those who appear to be contesting the reality that they are not being given entrance into the kingdom Jesus says to them, I will announce, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you lawbreakers. Now again, in this series, we're talking about some of the things that keep us from living in the fullness of Jesus' kingdom. Uh, because of the tendency we have so much to keep on holding on to those things. You know, week number one, we talked about the reality that we have to lay aside our personal beliefs. Right? Those things that, that we want to hold on to in the way of our own personal beliefs versus the truth of, of who Jesus is and the truth that he reveals to us. Right? Like when you encounter Jesus, you're going to encounter the truth. You're, and you're going to encounter a revelation of truth in your life. And sometimes those truths are going to be in conflict and are going to contradict the truths that you are already living your life according to. And in that moment, you have to decide, well, do I just continue to hold on to my truth as my truth and the truth of Jesus be damned? Or do I realign truth, my truth, to what Jesus has revealed to me as his truth? The second week we talked about our, our desire to hold on to, to keep our hands on things like power and control, right, of, of, of maintaining this position of power, right? The story of the centurion, this, this powerful um, Roman figure who in the story of his life comes and yields to Jesus. He, he exposes his vulnerability because of this thing that he so desperately wants, right? And we also, we need to encounter Jesus in such a way that we become exposed and vulnerable to our need for a savior, for our need to be rescued, for Jesus to do what only Jesus can do in our lives. Last week we talked about um, we desire to hold on to you know, our comfort, to things, to the material things uh, of this world, and what we need to do is be willing to recklessly abandon all the things that we're attached to, all those things that we think, you know, I've got a hold on this. The reality is, well, no, they actually have a hold on you. We have to be willing to recklessly abandon those things to enter into Jesus' kingdom and embrace what he has for our lives. Today I want to talk about the need for us to lay aside our own law and our own will to become obedient to the law and the will of God. Have you ever had something uh, to eat and like you're, you're eating it and it, there was like some really important flavor that was missing, right? Like it, it, it's not that it necessarily tasted really, really bad or was repulsive or anything like that. It's just like you're eating it and you're thinking, what's missing here? Uh, there's a little, I think of that going on in the text that we just read this morning, that um, Jesus highlights various things that these people who would profess to be in the good graces of God, they come to Jesus with all of the things that they've done, but Jesus seems to be far more focused on what is missing from their lives than what is manifest, right? Did you catch that? Jesus, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do miracles in your name? Which I think we'd all agree are like, well, those are some pretty incredible things, right? I mean, I've never cast out a demon or performed a miracle or anything like that. And so here these people stand before Jesus appealing to, you know, these particular examples that Jesus gives as some demonstration that, again, they're in the good graces of God. But Jesus, he focuses not on what they manifested in their lives, but instead on, on something that appears to be missing. Right? And I, just, I want us to think about the thing that is missing from the example of these people's lives. Not everyone, Jesus says, to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus, again, references this thing called the kingdom of heaven, which we've been looking at uh, every week. And while we're talking this, I, and, and when you hear these words, I don't want you to think of the kingdom of heaven as, as some place that isn't here, like that's up there somewhere. Um, in, in our minds, like in the kingdom of heaven, somewhere there, there, there's a castle. And inside of that castle somewhere, there's a throne. And on that throne is sitting Father God with God the Son sitting at his right hand. Like, I, um, that we're supposed to, like, 
do various things in this world so that someday we get to go there. Like, I don't want you to merely have that picture or, or for that to be the consuming idea when we talk about the kingdom of heaven. Because if that's all you think about, or even if it's primarily what you're thinking about, then you're really, you're, you're, you're missing practically everything that Jesus is emphasizing when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now, for one thing, the very idea that, like, there's this place where there's a throne and God's sitting on that throne is very limiting to the very nature of who God is. Like, God isn't confined to some place. He's not sitting on a chair somewhere that means that he is not everywhere else. No, God is, he's present everywhere. He's present here in our midst right now. He is spirit. He does not sit in a chair in a bodily form like you and I do. So again, just, just let that kind of a picture of the kingdom of heaven as being, you know, someplace that's up there that we go to when we die. Like, don't let that be the primary idea of what you see. Now, Jesus does highlight the residency of God the Father in this domain, the kingdom of heaven. And I think he does it to make a point of how important it is to do his will, right? So he says, of the kingdom of heaven, nobody enters there unless they do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he's not saying that so that we'll know where God is right now at this very moment. You know, like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Where in the world? Some of you will get that. Some of you are too young. Some of you are too old, okay? But some of you are right there in that sweet spot where you know exactly what I'm talking about. But where in the world is God the Father? Where is he, right? Um, Jesus isn't trying to help us understand where he happens to be in terms of his domain right now. What he's saying is the kingdom that he is bringing into the world and inviting us into, it's... It's a desirable destination. You ever been to somewhere desirable? You ever, you know, looked at the brochures and you thought, I want to go there, right? And then you made plans and you spent the money to go there and it was just, it was amazing and incredible, right? And you thought, I want to go back there again. Um, the kingdom of heaven is a desirable destination. It's so great. In fact, every week we're talking about just how great it is. Like so great that it's worth giving up everything to be a part of it. Um, but the logic that Jesus is using here is that the people who make their homes, the people who take up residency, the people who, um, who go to be in and dwell in the kingdom of heaven, you know who they are? They're not people that are living in revolt against the ruler of the kingdom of heaven, right? That would be silly, right? The people that are entering into the kingdom of heaven, they're not the people who at the same time have in their heart a deep rejection for the very ruler over that particular domain. Does that make sense? It's pretty logical, right? They will not be the, they will not be the people who hate the laws of the land, as it were, the laws of the land, which are a reflection of the king's desires, but rather it will be those who love living in the righteousness and peace and joy that flow out of the king's vision and therefore his will for the people, right? So again, Jesus just seems to be making this logical statement, right? That those who enter the kingdom of heaven are those who obey the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, we live today, we live out a shadow of those principles and priorities of the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven has already come to us. Again, this is why I don't want you to think about some place that's, that's there that's only for the future and, and, and only think about it in that sense, right? Jesus says the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven has come to you. It's arrived. It's here. And we're invited to participate in it. When our hearts cry out for God's will to be done, like previously in this sermon, you know, Jesus, he gives us what we have called the Lord's Prayer, right? What is, what is one of the cries of that prayer? Is it not your will be done, right? On earth, as it is in heaven, 
right? The kingdom of heaven operates according to the will and the rule of its king. And, and the cry of this prayer is, God, let your will, let the, let the priorities of your kingdom, which already govern the kingdom of heaven, let, let them come and meet us right here in our earthly experience right now. When we embody that desire by living out obedience to God's will, though we'll do it imperfectly and incompletely, what we're doing is we are expanding God's kingdom of heaven into the world today. Right? That's, that's what it sort of means for us to live in this sort of in-between place where the kingdom of Jesus has come to us. It's here. And we are invited to live in it. And when we, through obedience to the will of our Heavenly Father, when we live out the priorities of this kingdom, we are expanding his kingdom into the world. We are, we are becoming part of the very thing that we pray for when we say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the kingdom of heaven is a way of living now, right? It's a way of living right now, and it will be a place for us to live later. But Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? There will be some who neither truly live in God's present kingdom in the here and now, and that who will also be excluded from the realm of God's eternal kingdom when the time comes for that. He goes on to say, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name, right? Uh, and now Jesus, he points his attention to some who are in jeopardy of having deceived themselves during their lives. They're self-deceived. Like they stand before Jesus. Jesus, didn't we, right? And they, they just start, they start listing off all of the things that they, that they did that, that they thought would provide for an adequate evaluation for them to be welcomed into God's kingdom. Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Didn't we go there? Didn't we accomplish that? But they were self-deceived. Can I, um, for those of you that are following Jesus, can I, can I just share with you from, from my heart and with love a warning, a caution, maybe? If you're sitting here and as I'm uttering those words, right, and think, thinking about, you know, the, the, the kind of person that might stand before Jesus saying, Lord, Lord, did we not, did we not, did we not? And you're sitting there thinking, well, that could never be me. That will never be me. Can I, ju can I just encourage you to proceed cautiously, to think, you know, could that? Could, could I... Could I be living out a kind of form of Christianity that isn't actually the real thing? Like the person that goes out onto the golf course and whacks balls around. They're doing something that looks like golfing, but not necessarily playing the game of golf. Of these people, Jesus seems to be describing the reality that they protest their exclusion based on the activities that they were involved in. Right? They prophesied. They drove out demons. They did miracles. I, I, I don't know why Jesus happens to pick these three things as an example of the kinds of religious things that people might do that they would think would earn them favor in God's eyes. And, and Jesus doesn't, he doesn't disqualify the activities but rather what he seems to be doing is bringing to the forefront the thing that's missing. The thing that's missing, the thing that's really, 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 really important when it comes to understanding, you know, am I actually living in and bound for the kingdom of heaven or am I not? Uh, 
these people, they will appeal their good works as having been done in the name of Jesus. They had involved themselves in a kind of arena that might be linked to Jesus. They were able to do some incredibly good things, but the one thing they didn't do, the one thing that was missing was they didn't obey. They didn't obey the will of the Father. They didn't obey the will of Jesus. They didn't obey his commands. That's, that's what's missing. And so we have to ask ourselves, is obedience to Jesus what is missing from my life? Right? That's, that's the question that I have to confront myself with. Am I actually living in obedience to God's will for my life? One author wrote, one may with his lips loudly profess his faith in God and even invoke Jesus as Lord, yet deny him by thoughts words, and acts. Is obedience to Jesus what is missing from my life? Jesus responds to these. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. He says, I never knew you. Now, he's not, he doesn't literally mean I never knew you as if, like, I have no idea who you are, right? I mean, he is the all-knowing God of the universe. He knows exactly who they are. What Jesus is denying is that there is any real relationship that they possess with him. That anything substantial exists between those who are calling out, Lord, Lord, and the Lord himself. And what is this lack of relationship based on? What, what is it that Jesus says is sort of the sticking point that demonstrates that there's nothing really substantial. It's an unwillingness to do the will of the Father. That's what he says. See, Your unwillingness to do the will of the Father demonstrates the reality that we don't actually have a relationship with one another. Why? Because a relationship with Jesus accompanies a readiness to do his will. A relationship with Jesus accompanies a readiness to do his will. He describes them as those who practice lawlessness. Now, there's a very, very interesting thing that he accuses them of because the people that he says of them, you who practice lawlessness, the one thing that they probably weren't doing was practicing lawlessness. To this particular audience, the thing that was extremely sacred to them was the law. In fact, it was the law that they would ultimately appeal to as being the thing, the, the linchpin that would have them entering into the king. The law as they understood it. But while they might have lived out a sort of, a kind of, a variant of living according to the law of God, the law of God as they wanted it to be, the reality is that they weren't living in obedience to the Father. And for that, they are now called those who practice lawlessness. Now some of you are familiar with the broader scope of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. This is the very toward the tail end of chapter 7. And a lot of people have the idea that the Sermon on the Mount, which is this beautiful thing, in fact, we did a whole series on, um, on much of the sermon um, last year that you can look up and listen to if you like. A lot of people have the idea that the sermon is it's just, and, and Jesus' teaching can ultimately kind of be boiled down to a collection of, of ethical maxims Right? Just these, these principles, these virtues by which we ought to live, all of which you know, are, are ultimately a demonstration of our love for God and our love for one another. Right? And, then that, and then that's it. But it's just interesting, the sermon concludes here with a very definite call to obedience. Right? That is, like, it was never Jesus' intent for us to be like awestruck by the beauty and the majesty of the things that he, sh that he taught or that he shared. 
right? It's not, like, it's not enough for us to sit here and ruminate over, oh, you know what, that is, boy, if everybody could just do that, that would, wouldn't that be just fantastic? If we could actually live, like, live out these principles, these virtues, these ethics, I mean, what a, what a, what a beautiful, fanciful world we'd all live in. It wasn't enough for people to just sit and, like, listen and even appreciate what Jesus was teaching. Jesus says, okay, listen, I've given you my commands. I have revealed to you the will of the Father. And now, now you're faced with a choice. And the choice is to either do the will of my Father or not. And so here, Jesus is referring to a kind of judgment day, and he is telling us that you know, on Judgment Day, it's obedience that will stand and everything else will fall. Uh, we're accustomed to being in places, and perhaps we've done it or our kids have done it with us, where, you know, something's gone wrong and we make all kinds of excuses for why we did such and such or why we chose such and such. Ultimately, obedience is the thing that stands on the Day of Judgment and everything else falls. Now, something very, very important I don't want for any of us to miss, and that is this. Am I making the statement, and are we then, therefore, to believe this idea that we are accepted by God because of what we do? Like, is that, what, is that all of what we're saying is that, well, God either accepts us or rejects us based on what we do? And I know that it's possible to have taken something like that away from what we have talked about. But that is not what, at all what we're saying. We're not saying that living out and living in and living for Jesus' kingdom is like a scorecard where the lowest score wins. Right? When you play in a golf tournament... Everybody's competing for the lowest score, and the person with the lowest score is the winner of the tournament. Or um, if you're trying to qualify for some other tournament, there is a particular score you have to make in order to advance to the next level. We're not talking about that. We're not saying that, all right, well, here's the cutoff, right? And everything that is, you know, that, that exceeds this level of obedience, they make it, and everything that's below the line, well, they don't. It's not a scorecard. This is about your heart. This is about my heart. It's always about our heart. And it's about a choice that you and I make from our heart. It's not ultimately about our performance, like as it is measured, and then therefore determined whether or not we make it or we don't. Like... Well, you didn't do enough righteous things, and so this is a pass-fail test, and you have failed, you don't make it. Or you have done enough or some bad enough unrighteous things that this is a pass-fail test, you fail, you don't make it. This is about our heart, and it's about the choice we make from our heart. And if I could, I'd just maybe share a couple examples of what I mean by that. Um, when I first got my license, I drove the way I wanted to. How many of you, when you got your license, drove the way you wanted to? Anybody? And I was punished multiple times for driving the way I wanted to. But then there came a point where I stopped doing what I wanted. where I surrendered myself in obedience to the law of the land. Now, I will tell you that when that happened, and it did, it happened. Like, I can, I can tell you when it happened. I can tell you why it happened. But it happened. Since that time have I, which has been many, many years now, since that time, have I 
followed perfectly the law of the land? I have not. I have not. It's been in my heart to follow the law, right? So it's my heart that changed. My attitude toward the law changed. And now my heart embraces the law, but I don't follow it perfectly. You know why? Because sometimes I don't plan well, and I'm rushing out of some place at the very last minute, and I'm late for the next thing or the next place that I have to be. And yes, I'm talking to my wife right now. Right? And, and so what do I do? Well, I exceed the speed limit so that I can maybe make up the time that I've lost by my poor planning. So I've broken the law. It's not that I wanted to, but I did. And I'll do it again. Right? But, but the nature of my heart, the desire of my heart doesn't change. Right? It's, I want to abide by the law. Sometimes I'm guilty of not paying attention to the law. Um, I've been pulled over uh, one time in South Berwick on a really rainy day. Visibility wasn't very great. Come through this 25-mile-an-hour zone, and I just came right up to a police officer, right, who was driving ahead of me that I didn't see. And so he pulls over. I go by. He puts his lights on, and he pulls me over and says to me when I open up the window, hey, you came up on me pretty fast there. And I said, I did, and I'm sorry. And I didn't get a ticket. I mean, he took my license and my registration. He went back. He looked at the computer. And um, enough years had gone by that I didn't show up anymore. <laughs> right? And, and so I've been, I have been pulled over multiple times for, not, for, for, for an infraction of the law. But since that, it, what's interesting, not that, not that I'm immune to getting a ticket. I mean, yeah, I might get a ticket someday when I'm not paying attention. But... Like, up to this point, for many, many years now, since that time when my heart changed, like, I haven't, I haven't gotten a ticket. I've gotten pulled over. I've been talked to. I've been warned, right? But I don't know what it is. I don't know if maybe the police officer recognizes that there's, all right, you know, here's a guy that he's doing his best. He's trying. Like, he, he's not recklessly or um, rebelliously negating the law. And so I share that because I think it illustrates the reality of, like, how we live in the kingdom, which is that um, our hearts need to change. Our posture needs to be one of obedience to the law of God. We recognize that we don't do it perfectly all the time. And in those moments, we need grace. And we need God's mercy. And aren't you glad for God's grace and God's mercy? The problem, I think, sometimes is that we, we, we just ab- we deceive ourselves into thinking that that's what we're doing when the reality is our heart's not really there. And that's where the problem is. To love Jesus is to love the law of Jesus. To love Jesus is to love the law of Jesus. Another question is, well, is obedience too much of a burden for us to carry? Like, if I'm going to come and be obedient to Jesus, is that just a, is that a burden that is just too much for me to carry? Um, so the rules of golf are extensive. The rules of golf, uh, there's a rule book. And there are decisions regarding those rules that have been made over the course of time. And it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. I know some of you are shopping on Amazon right now to get your hands on a copy of the rules of golf, right? So the rules of golf, they are. They're, they're very, very expansive. And because I love the game of golf, the competition of golf, I, this is going to sound weird, but I love the rules of golf. Sometimes those rules are inconvenient. Sometimes those rules I wish maybe were a little different. Sometimes those rules cost me something that I wish they hadn't cost me. But on the whole, my, my, my attitude toward the rules of golf is one that, well, I love the rules of golf. And you know who else loves the rules of golf? Uh, the professionals that you watch on TV who have millions of dollars at stake. They love the rules of golf. 
the, the avid, competitive golfer like myself, we love the rules of golf. The, the four old guys that play every single Saturday with two bucks on the line, who would be mad to find out that somebody in their group was cheating or taking advantage of the rules of golf. They care about the rules of golf. And then there are some who are ambivalent to the rules because they don't want to play the game of golf. They want to do something different from golf. And for them, the rules would actually be a burden. Right? The, the rules would actually take away from their enjoyment of the game. And so if that's you, when it comes to golf, by all means, don't keep score. Don't keep score. Um, can I tell you one more story? Um, I won't tell you who it involves because it would embarrass Doug Spaulding if I told you who it involved. <laughs> uh, but some years ago, uh, Doug and Jeff Howe, who plays the bass here sometimes on stage, we were playing golf, and, um, and we always start like, with the idea that we're, we're playing golf. Uh, both, you know, I'm playing against the golf course, I'm playing for myself, but we're also sort of playing, you know, kind of against one another, and so we're keeping score. And, um, and so Doug hit his ball into um, what was called a hazard, which is now called a penalty area, and at the time, the rule was, you know, you hit your ball into an area like that. Um, how many of you have gone miniature golfing before? You hit your ball in the water, right? You got to go get it with the little basket thing. And then you, what do you do? You put the ball near the point where it went into the water, and you give yourself a penalty stroke, right? If you care about the rules of golf. Hello? Okay. That's right. How many of you want to go miniature golfing with me later on this afternoon? Anybody? <laughs> no? All right. So, so the rule is you can, you, can, you can put your ball, you can drop a, a, you know, a ball and, and proceed to play with a penalty stroke. Or, um, I mean, you can try to find your ball and play it out of there as it lies. And so he walks in there and he finds his ball and so he's going to play it. And, and so what he does, like we're kind of going about our thing and he just starts, he starts whacking. Like he's just, you know, whacking the grass like he's taking some practice strokes or clearing out all the junk that was around his ball or whatever. And, and then he finally hits his ball out. And we finish and putt out and everything and, you know, kind of head back to our carts and, and everybody's declaring the scores and Doug says, the score he got. And I said, well, plus the two-stroke penalty. And he said, for what? I said, well, you grounded your club in a penalty area. You can't do that. He's like, what do you mean I can't do that? I was like, like Doug, everybody knows that rule. Like, that's one of the... I know you might not know, but that is a that is an elementary, that's a first grade, kindergarten, preschool kind of rule. You can't you can't improve the condition of your ball to make it easier for you to hit it. You gotta just hit it. And don't tell him I told you this, but <laughs> he freaked out. <laughs> and he goes to the golf cart and he unstraps his bag, because we're sharing a golf cart together. And he just walks off. He's just going to play golf by himself from here on out. And I don't know if it took a hole or two for the, the wound to be healed, but eventually the wound was healed. And so Doug got back on the golf cart and we finished our round of golf. But we realized, you know what? If we're going to enjoy a round of golf with Doug, like, we just can't keep score. Like, we got to do something else. Right? So for some, the I, like, the love for God's law, it's not a burden. Like when you love Jesus, your attitude toward the law of Jesus, it's changed. Your heart changes toward it. The psalmist says, and I memorized this verse when I was a kid. Some of you have as well. Psalm 119 verse 11. Listen to this. The psalmist expresses this to God. He says, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. I've treasured it. Now, I, I, like, I know there's laws out there that are really annoying, right? Like, we just did taxes, mo many of us. How many of you love tax law? Oof, right? What a burden. We don't love it. And so it's a burden to us, right? And any law that's sort of over you becomes a burden to you. <laughs> Rob, I'm almost there, I promise.
You know what? I feel like in the room right now, there's a lot of people that don't love the law of God. <laughs> Tyler, are you feeling that? Yeah. You're feeling that? I have treasured your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Later on, in verse 111, I have your decrees as a heritage forever. Indeed, they are the joy of my heart. How many of you, when you were kids, you said to your mom and dad, Mom, Dad, I just love the rules that you have set up for us to, you know, live in in our home. How many of you have ever done that? Right? How many of you ever, as kids in school, you, you, you just, like, you, you purposely stopped by the principal's office. And you said to the principal, Mr. or Mrs. whatever, you know, I, I, you probably don't hear this very often, but I just want you to know how much I appreciate and love the rules of our school. Thank you so much. Hey, we don't do that. Right? We consider so many of those kinds of rules a burden. But here the psalmist expresses the, the law of God. It's a joy to my heart. If your heart has become ambivalent to God's law, I just ask you to think, you know, well, why is that? Is there something that I'm wanting to hold on to more? Is there something that I am preferring over the law of God for my life? One final quote. And then we close. Michael Green says this. Notice how here, as so often in the teaching of Jesus, we are challenged to decide. There is no comfortable middle ground embracing most of us and leaving on either side the very good and the very bad. How comfortable it would have been were that the case. But Christianity is not about being very good or very bad or very comfortable. It is about being in God's kingdom or staying out. It is about allegiance to God or rebellion. It is about being on the road that starts narrow but opens out into the life of heaven or staying on the broad road of our self-centeredness until it contracts to a dead halt in final destruction. An awesome choice, he says. And we find at the end of the sermon, we are not permitted merely to admire the teaching. We are challenged to bow to the preacher. Not this preacher. The preacher Jesus. And he closes with these questions. Have you entered in? Are you on the road.